Hello, this is Henry Nassino. I'm a solutions engineer on the Google Cloud Platform team. And today's session is going to be around cloud networking in Google Cloud Platform. Today, what I'm going to cover is at a high level, start out with kind of uh, Google Cloud Platform networking, and we'll kind of drill down into what is a default or sometimes referred to as a legacy network. Then we'll talk about subnetworks inside GCP and why most customers tend to uh, uh, gravitate toward using subnetworks than the default or legacy networks. The next part of this, we'll talk about connecting Google Cloud uh, to possibly another Google Cloud project or to an on-premise network using Cloud VPN and then doing automatic routing with our cloud router. And then the last portion of this is going to talk about a network service which is our global load balancer that you can use to load balance requests going into um, HTTP, HTTPS requests, TCP, or UDP requests to a backend service or services. Um, so with that, let's go ahead. So um, at a real high level, uh, the Google network is a far-reaching network, multi-continent, multi-countries, uh, multiple points of presence, uh, 70 plus points of presence across 30, 30 countries. And really the idea here is um, customers want to get onto the Google network as fast as possible, um, have traffic travel inside the Google network without leaving the Google network, get a response and coming back out as close to the customer as possible. And one of the key differentiators of Google is the way we connect our data centers to each other. Um, all through our own private network, privately owned network, all through our own fiber, across the Atlantic, across oceanic cables that we own ourselves. Um, so it really is kind of using Google's network versus going back out to the internet uh, to go from one data center, from one Google data center to another data center. So we manage all that traffic, we manage the uh, bandwidth, the latencies, the, um, the connectivity across all of our Google uh, data centers. So going into kind of a Google Cloud project, um, and this is sometimes referred to as a legacy network or a default network, uh, within a Google Cloud project, you can create up to five of these legacy networks. And the, each network can use a single RFC 1918 CIDR range. So if you wanted to create multiple projects and you wanted to communicate or multiple networks inside of a project and you wanted to communicate between the networks uh, because each one of them is its own CIDR range, its own private network, the only way to communicate with them is going through an external IP. So in the old world, networks were the only mechanism to group VMs uh, by, by IP addresses. So again, this is kind of considered the, the legacy network. Um, Today, we have something called subnetworks, which again, are, are, which we see much more uh, traction with our customer base. So how does this look like um, as far as the legacy network? If you have a single address space, say it's 10 to 40, uh, 0, 0 slash 16, you might have multiple regions and multiple zones um, inside or putting resources in multiple regions and multiple zones, but you're in that single address space. So if you look at 10.240.2.1 as an example, um, you would think that um, 10.240.2.2 or something uh, close to that would also be in that same region, that same zone. So if actually another example is in zone in region two, zone A, we have 10.240.1.4 and region one, zone A, we have but what you would think of the next continuous address would be 10.240.1.5. And then we look at zone B and we have 10.240.1.6. So you can see from a, from a logical kind of what you'd expect, because we have one address space and bringing up a resource in various regions and various zones, um, you, would, you know, some people would get kind of confused that the continuous network, uh, the next kind of logical IP address could be in a different region in a different zone where they would expect maybe there would be some groupings of IP addresses by region, by zone. Again, this is a legacy network. 
So moving kind of to where we are today, uh, and again, you have the ability to create both legacy networks and subnetworks in Google Cloud projects today. So subnetworks um, are, again, they reside inside a global network resource, and you can create 100 subnetworks per project. And each subnetwork now can have a single RFC 1918 side range instead of having a single uh, RFC 1918 side range across your whole network. Now you can create uh, each one of these for each subnetwork. Um, and, and communication between subnetworks can now be used using internal IP addresses. So again, before the only way, if I, if I created multiple projects or multiple networks, the only way for those to communicate was external IPs. Uh, now we're using subnets, we can communicate using internal IP addresses. And we can group um, firewalls and routes uh, based on instance tags, which I'll kind of show you a, a bit later here and how that works. So picture of subnetworks. Now again, we have a, a view. And this time, we don't have our single address space at kind of the, the global network layer. But we have a subnetwork, subnetwork 1, which is 10240024, 0, 0, subnet 2, which is a 192 address, slash 24, and subnet 3, which is a 10.2 address uh, with a slash 16. And here it's kind of more logically what you would think. So inside of region one, zone A and subnet one, I bring up a resource and I'm going to get a 10.2.40.0.1. Bring up another uh, compute instance, I'm going to get a 10.2.40.0.2. Likewise, inside of subnet two, kind of have that same scenario where you get the IP allocation the way you'd expect. And in subnet three, a little bit different in that our subnet is across zones. Uh, but again, within that subnet, you'd get the 10.2.0.1. And the second instance you bring up, you'd get the 10.2.0.2. So logically, um, it's kind of what you would expect from an address uh, perspective, uh, that you get continuous addresses that are within a given subnet. And uh, like we mentioned earlier, like I mentioned earlier, uh, we can now communicate with these internal IP addresses across subnets. Uh, so again, I think I'm going to mention most of these already, um, but yeah, the predictable IP ranges is something I just talked about. So uh, you're no longer kind of struggling when trying to when you're given an address, you know which region, which zone, which subnet it belongs to. Uh, each has its own side range. Um, there's two ways to allocate a subnetwork range. One is by creating an automatic or auto subnet network, or you can create a custom subnet network. Um, I'm going to go through a demo and use a custom one. Uh, but again, it would be probably it would be much it would be even simpler if I just went ahead and used the auto sub network uh, or provision an auto sub network. Uh, the, the, uh, one constraint is each sub network is restricted to a single region. Uh, but again, like you saw in the other, uh, it can a a sub network can span multiple zones in a single region. Mentioned earlier that actually before we do this, let me kind of pop back into a, into a demo. Uh, so let me go into, if I have two projects and I'll spend most of my time in one project called CPD 200. And just a review of what I have in here. So from a compute perspective, I have no resources. From a networking perspective, I have just the default network, which is the 10.2.40 slash 16 network. Um, I don't have a VPN. I don't have any routers. And all I have are the default fire rules that come with when, you, when, you, when it was initially provisioned uh, this project with a default network. So this is basically a generic uh, Google Cloud project, kind of just spun up and uh, kind of what you'd see by default. Um, I have another project that I'm going to be connecting through VPN, uh, but in, in it's a project that I've been using for a while, but again, it has no VPN. Um, it has the, some firewall rules for the default project, and I do have compute instances already allocated in here. Okay, So again, I'm going to spend most of my time over here in this kind of newly provisioned uh, GCP project. And the first thing that I want to do is provision a a subnetwork. So let me, actually I'm going to do it one way. 
I am going to go over here and actually do it through the command line. Um, then I'll walk through the UI and show you how, it, how that would happen there in the UI as well. So let me go ahead and list. So first thing I'm going to do is create a subnetwork. So let me just do a cat on this. So this is using the command line interface. Um, I tend to do a lot of things using the command line interface, so it's repeatable and easy to do, and I know I won't make any mistakes in the UI and clicking around and typing the wrong addresses in. Uh, but as you can see, I'm creating uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, uh, nine subnets um, on this subnetwork. And each subnet kind of relate to one subnet for Central, one subnet for Europe, one subnet for Asia. And then I've created the next six subnets in the East region. And each one of them I'm basically calling a rack. So rack one, rack two, rack three, rack four, rack five, rack six. And you can see I'm allocating specific CIDR ranges for each one of these subnets. Okay. All right, let me go ahead and run that. And then let me go back into the slides while this runs. Okay, so what I'm actually doing now at this point is I am creating these subnets, subnets that I mentioned earlier. And in the case of what I'm doing, I am using a custom, instead of an auto subnetwork, I'm using a custom sub subnet. And I actually, for my uh, central, west, and east, I use the same side of range if I had created an auto subnet. Um, and then for US east, you saw the, the specific uh, custom sub subnet IP ranges that I created for that one. So in, in my example, um, you're going to see Asia and Europe are using this IP range and Central is using this and then I had those uh, six, six racks which were using the uh, custom subnet ranges, IP ranges. So this is kind of the, um, you know, what I was doing using a manual, manual subnet IP range. Um, again, I had a specific subnet range for each one of the, the racks um, inside of uh, U.S. East 1, Rack 1, U.S. East, Rack 2, and so on. So from the command line, again, this is kind of what I showed uh, briefly when I was in the uh, shell, is I created a subnet um, called, I could have called it, I called mine U.S. Central, and then I uh, set a, a range, an IP range. And again, I use the default ranges for, uh, for Central, um, and the Asia and European subnets. And the next part that I'm doing in this demo is go ahead and allocate the various instances. So when you create an instance or a, a Google Compute instance, um, you are going to specify basically which zone it's going to apply to um, and, and which subnet. But I'm not using a default, you could be using the default network, if not using the default network, which subnet is this particular compute uh, engine instance gonna, um, gonna belong to. Yeah, I'm gonna get to this in a bit. So let me uh, kind of go back and see where we are on our subnet creation. Okay, so now we are, we have created the US Central, the Europe, Asia, and we're now creating the subnets for each of the six racks. We've created uh, the subnet for rack one, subnet for rack two, and subnet for rack three. Uh, there went subnet for rack four, and let's just give this another uh, probably 20, 30 seconds, and we'll get uh, rack five and rack, rack six allocated and configured. All right, there's rack five. And we will get rack six here in a second. And then I will go back into the UI 
and show you what I have created. And actually, let me, I'll do one other thing before I go in, back into the UI as well. All right, there's our six uh, racks or our six subnets in the US East, as well as our subnets for US Central, Europe, and Asia. So the next thing I'm going to do is create the GCE or Google Compute Engine instances and place them in the respective subnets. So let me go ahead and run that. And then I'll go back while this is running. I will go back and um, check out the UI. Okay, so this is going to create um, the GCE instances. And one of the things that, uh, and again, this is basically running. So we just finished this command for my nine subnets. And then now we're running, um, I think about nine of these to put a Google Compute Engine instance on each one of those subnets. So let me go back into the UI and take a look at the subnets. So as you can see, uh, where we only had a default network before, now after my, uh, my script has, has finished, now I have nine subnetworks and I have again the various uh, IP address ranges for each one of those subnetworks. And like I mentioned, I was taking the same ones that the auto would use um, to go ahead and create Central, West, and Asia. Then I divided up East into six racks, each one of those having their own CIDR range. So how this looks in the UI, um, if I go into create network, um, I could go ahead and create a, whatever, my subnetwork. And um, I can go ahead and specify automatic, and then I would get these IP ranges and these four subnets. Um, and then I'd get some default fire rules that are created once I create this network. Okay, but in my case, I did not use an automatic, so I did my script is creating some custom subnetworks specifically in uh, US East. So we can actually go into this and we can see some of the default things. So we see again the details here and the routes uh, that were created for this specific uh, for this specific subnetwork. Okay, so the next thing again, uh, which is running right now, if we go into Compute Engine, we're going to see instances start to come online. So we see Asia, MIA, and our first central instance. Uh, and then now we're bringing up our east in first east instance coming online. And just to, another thing I want to point out, which uh, was mentioned on one of the slides previously, is this kind of notion of tagging. So I've tagged the Asian instance, compute instance, with a tag called tag Asia. Uh, this one is in tag EMEA. And I believe for US Central, it's going to be tag Central. And I use these tags later on to set up firewall rules. So I'm going to allow some things to happen based on tags. Um, and again, you'll, you'll get a view for this when I go back into the uh, slides and back into the demo as well. So let me do that. So now back into the slides. And the next thing, again, I'm going to do here is we're going to talk about subnet isolation here as we start talking about tags. So go in present mode. So if you look at this particular subnetwork, and really what we're trying to do is isolate some said subnetworks, some subnets from others. So in this case, I want to, I've got three subnets here, uh, uh, subnet A, subnet B, and subnet C. And what I really want to do is have the ability for subnet A to communicate with subnet B and subnet C, but I don't want subnet B and to be able to communicate with subnet C or subnet C with subnet B. So the way to accomplish this uh, is to use tags. So I can tag all instances in subnet A, B, and C. Um, then create a fire rule to enable communication between subnet A and subnet B and between subnet A and subnet C. So the way this looks from the uh, uh, command line interface is I could add tags to a instance and I, I would call the tag in this case tag subnet A and then I would create a firewall rule that would basically allow subnet A 
these protocols, TCP, UDP, ICMP, from this range, which is the subnet A CIDR range, to these targets. And the targets, in this case, are um, you know, the, the instances that are in subnet B and subnet C that I have tagged with tag subnet B and tag subnet C. And, target, and as, uh, yeah, yeah, so really I've accomplished what this diagram is saying. Subnet A can do a TCP, UDP, or ICMP uh, uh, connect to from A to B or from A to C, but B can't go to C and C can't go to B. Let's quickly check on how the instances are going. Maybe they have to refresh. All right. It's like we got all of our nine instances. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, notice I've created two instances, um, two instances in rack one. So this one is an instance in rack one, and this is another instance in, in rack one. And know that you can see the con continuous IP addresses in, in rack one, then 10.0.1.2 and 10.0.1.3. Okay, so now we have our instances that are on our subnets and on our, on our subnetwork. Um, and then the next thing I want to do is, let me go back in the, to the shell, is, is allow SSH. So if I just go back directly in here and I try to SSH into any one of these, let's say central, and I'll open a browser SSH session and in, in about 10, 15 seconds, we'll see this fail. All right, it took a little longer, but yeah, we failed, unable to connect to this SSH into this instance in our central region. Let me close this down. And the reason it failed, if we go into networking firewall rules, remember when I first brought this up, all the default fire rules just apply to the default network. So basically it's not, not gonna allow anything into my subnetwork at this point. So let me go in and run a script here to allow SSH. And again, what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna allow SSH to my target tags of everything in Asia, everything in EMEA, everything central, and everything in east, and from any source. So let me go ahead and run that. So this should finish relatively quickly, and I'll go back and SSH into my uh, one of my central instances. All right. So now, if I refresh this, we should see a new rule for my sub network network. So here's a rule, a firewall rule that I just created from any source to my three destinations, EMEA, Central, and East, and Asia. And now, if I go into Compute Engine, uh, I'll do the exact same one, try to get in SSH into my Central instance, and we should be able to successfully SSH in now that we have that firewall rule in place. All right, there we go. We are in US Central 1. Let's make that a little bigger. And I'll just log out for now. Uh, maybe I'll need this one later, so we'll stay in. All right, so now the next thing I'm going to do 
is go back in the cloud shell. And now the, the next thing I want to do is kind of like we showed in the slides. So this whole idea of isolation. So now I am go only going to allow uh, pings originating from my central, uh, let me go back in. I'm only going to allow pings that originate from my central region. So basically my, this instance that I just SSH'd into, I'm only going to allow pings from that particular instance to my other instances in my other regions. So let me, actually I'm here already, so let me try to ping something in my east using the private IP address. So again, so this is going from central to east. And I'll just give that a couple seconds and end it. You know, see these all failed, 100% packet loss. So now I'm going to go back into the shell and I'm going to run the next one, which is four. And this is going to allow ICMP from the central region. And I will uh, take a look at this after it runs. Uh, but yeah, it's just a, another firewall rule that's allowing uh, me to ping uh, pings that originate from the central region uh, to my other regions. Okay, there it goes. And you can see the central region subnet as this IP address and the target tags. So I'm gonna be able to ping from central to central to east to EMEA or to Asia. So in the, this case, I ran it from central to east previously, and this one failed. So now we do it, and now we can successfully ping our east instance from our central instance. Okay. All right. So now the next portion of this. So we did some network isolation. So the next part we're going to talk about is uh, VPNs, I believe. Yeah, and actually we have a few slides. So again, this is again showing the power of subnets and subnetworks. So the idea here is I might have multiple subnetworks in my project or subnets, and maybe some subnets I want to be able to access my VPN tunnel and connect back to my, my private or my customer on-premises network. And some sub subnetworks, I only I don't want to have them access to, to communicate with my customer on-premise network. So in this example, again, we tag uh, the instances in subnet A, and then we add a route to all VMs in subnet A. And this route has a destination of 192.168.1.0 slash 24, which is my on-prem customer network, and then a next hop of tunnel A. So now if we look at this, we're going to see the next hop of tunnel A, destination range, 192.168, um, and we're coming from a, a tag called tag subnet A. So again, this, this gives us the desired effect of only allowing traffic from sub subnet A into the customer network on-premises, as an example. So a little bit more about VPNs. So in the legacy network, if, even if you had two regions, let's say the East region and, and Europe, uh, again, because we're all in the single address space, so the way they connect from a, let's say, an on-premise network to, to those two uh, regions uh, in Google Cloud was to create a VPN, gate, uh, VPN tunnel from, um, from East region back to the on-premise network and the VPN tunnel from your Europe region back into your enterprise network. And going the other direction though, when you're, make, when you're sending from your enterprise network back out, notice that because we have one single address space, 10240.00/16, that the enterprise network thinks of this as, as one giant network. So even though I might be directing to 10240.0.15, we're actually gonna send traffic across both tunnels and then the correct uh, VPN gateway will route it to the, to the correct instance. 
but we can't really at this point determine if it should go to VPN 0 or VPN 1 because the destination address is a single address space. Now taking a look at the same view, um, we have Europe and the East region, and we have our VPN connections to those from our enterprise network. Now VPN 0 can be specified with a destination address of, of 1.0, and VPN, VPN 1 has the destination address of 10.240.2.0. So now when, when I send data across, now it knows either to go for, to the VPN 1 tunnel or the VPN 0 tunnel without sending it across both of them uh, based on where, where my destination IP address is where my instances reside in. Okay, now we'll talk a little bit about more. So we started on VPN. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about VPN um, and talk about a scenario where you might need um, to use uh, BGP routing or a cloud router to ease kind of the maintenance of VPN connectivity. So in this example, we have a Google Cloud Platform project and a network on the left-hand side, and we have a peer gateway and a, a peer network, which could, again, could be an on-premise network. And this is what I was actually trying to mimic in my little demo where we had multiple racks. And the idea is that with static routing, across my VPN tunnel and my VPN gateway and peer gateway. With static routing, every time I added um, a new rack, I'd have to add that both to my peer gateway and to my Google VPN gateway. So there would be kind of this manual process where the person over here would add it, uh, update the gateway on this side, and tell people on this side whether or not they, sh they should allow uh, traffic to, to hit this new rack. So if you're adding new ranges on this side, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of volatility and a, a, a lot of new ranges and new racks being created. There's gonna be a lot of manual effort to keep all the routing tables in sync and keep the latest and greatest routing table in the peer gateway as well as uh, available through the Google VPN gateway. So to kind of alleviate the maintenance and management of always having to manually update these uh, new racks as they come online, you can use a, a BGP router. So with a BGP router, when a new network comes up, uh, the BGP uh, uh, capable gateway will basically automatically update its routes and automatically publish um, to the route to the BGP router on the other side what the new route is without having to manually go in there and modify that, hey, I've created a new rack and that new rack to allow uh, VPN traffic to flow through the VPN gateway. So again, it's, it's much better from a management perspective. Um, and you, you, know, you won't be forgetting, oh, I forgot to add that rack. Oh, I forgot to add that, that new side of range on both sides of the equation. So let's take a look at how that works. And again, I'm gonna work through um, the VPN part of this uh, demo first, and I'm gonna go through a, a BGP router part of this as well. So let me pop back in. So the next part of this is I am, I actually need to do one little housekeeping job first. So I'm in Cloud Shell and I got to switch this over to my other project because in my case, I'm connecting two projects together. Uh, again, you could kind of simulate this as, you know, a cloud project and a um, on-prem and enterprise network. So let me change this over to use the other project I have. So Google, actually, I think I have a script for it. Set project region, so set project region. Okay, so now just let me make sure. So notice this switched from CPB 2128, this switched to HNC no sandbox. And if I wanna check the region, do a G Cloud um, config list compute region, and this should be US Central. Okay, so now we're all set on this side. So the first thing I'm going to do is I am going to um, create the VPN uh, cloud VPN on on the uh, CPB 200 project. So I will run 
script number five, which is going to go ahead and create the, the cloud. Uh, in this case, I'm calling this side the peer VPN. So I'm creating the peer VPN on this side. And then on my other project, which is HNCNO Sandbox, I am going to create the cloud VPN. So let me do that. Okay, this is going to take a little bit to run, I believe. So let's see here. So, if, oh, oh, shell. Okay, it's almost done. So again, the CPB200 is my peer VPN and my HNC no sandbox is my cloud VPN. Okay. But this is the last step. Yep. And this is the last step here. And once it's done, I will go back into the UI and I'll kind of show you what's uh, configured. So let me go into CPB 200 and we're going to go into the networking. So again, this is my peer VPN on this side of it. And so Peer VPN is created. It's actually already up and running. So I thought if I look over here, this is almost done. So the peer, peer VPN and the cloud VPN are already created. So both sides are created. You see the green box here. It means that the VPN tunnel between the two is set up and it basically does some simple tests to make sure the tunnel and, and traffic can flow through. So that's created. And if I go ahead and drill down from the peer VPN side, and you can look in here. So you can see from the peer side, here's the IP, the local IP ranges that I want to be able to initiate or send uh, traffic across the VPN. Um, this is the actual IP address of my VPN gateway itself. This is the IP address of the remote VPN gateway. In this case, it's the, the cloud VPN um, using IKA version two, a shared secret, and in this case, the routing is static. Um, and then coming from the other side, this is my default network on the other side. So I'm gonna bring allow traffic from that default network on the other side uh, to these um, specified local IP ranges here on this side. Okay. Now, if I go back to the other project, you're gonna kind of see the exact opposite. So if I go in networking, VPN, so this is still actually running on this side. I'm trying to get the connection. Yeah, so this should come back in a second. And you can actually go ahead and, and look in here. So on the cloud VPN side, again, you can kind of do the same thing. So on the cloud VPN side, this is my IP address of my device here on this side. The remote is the, uh, the VPN gateway address of my, my other box on the other side. Ike v2, shared secret, static. Uh, remote IP addresses, uh, 10, uh, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Uh, notice here I purposely left off. I think I actually have five, maybe six uh, 
um, racks, and I purposely left them off, uh, and I'll show you why. And then local IP ranges um, that are allowed to use this VPN gateway is my, my whole default network on this side. All right, so we've got that network set up. So now, because I think I actually have, so let me go into here and get one of the internal IP addresses, so 10.240.0.1.5. So where we left off right here, we have the IP address of, um, of Foo Instance, which is my, in my H. Nacino Sandbox project inside the central region. And now that I have my VPN connectivity, if I go into um, If I go into US Central Instance 1, which is in my CPB200 project, uh, US Central Instance 1, but notice it's in my centrals, it's in my central zone or central region, and it has this internal IP address. So if you remember, when I set up my VPN, I only allowed connections to come through that were either from Rack 1, um, yeah, Rack 1, Rack 2, Rack 3, and Rack 4. So if I actually initiate a, a ping from something from my central region, I should actually expect this to fail. So again, if I ping this, so we go ahead and fail, 100% packet loss. So now if I go into one of my east region, let's say rack one and SSH here, And now, if I do that same ping, now we're able to get through from one of my instances that's on one of the racks in, uh, in US East. Let me kill that. So also notice, remember back here um, on this configuration on HNC No Sandbox project, if I went into networking, and went into the VPN configuration. Again, this is what I was talking about before. So it's only gonna allow um, traffic from these subnets. And again, the uh, central region instance was not on this subnet, nor is uh, any instances that are in rack five. So again, if I go back to rack five and SSH, from there, we'll go ahead and try to ping from rack five, and I will expect this one to fail as well, because that again, that traffic from that rack was not allowed through the VPN tunnel. All right, so now what I want to do is now that I have a successfully configured VPN tunnel with static, static routing, now I'm going to switch that over to, um, uh, to use uh, dynamic routes with uh, BGP routers uh, configured on both sides. So to do that, let me go back out of here. Actually, let me go back and go back to CPD200. And actually, let me take a look at one other thing. Go into shell. Oop, I want to get in the other one. And then, hmm. okay. So now what I'm going to do, if I go back into my peer project and go into the VPN configuration, I'm actually going to go here and delete my peer VPN gateway, my peer VPN on this side. And I am going to do the exact same thing on this side as well. So I'm in the cloud VPN and I am going to go ahead and delete it.
Okay, while that's happening, I'm going to go ahead and create the routers on both sides. So um, again, I'll do this from the command line. So in this case, it is um, create the uh, a peer router. So it's six. And then on the HTC No Sandbox, it is two. So my cloud router on this side and my peer router on the other side. So those both got created quickly. Um, I'll do a quick check on them in the UI. So my cloud router, uh, refresh. So my, uh, my peer router, because I'm in CPB 200, and they have an ASN of 64513. And on my HNSINO project, um, my cloud router is 64512 is my ASN here, and this is my cloud router. So now I am going to create a VPN that uses the cloud router instead of um, in, yeah, in, in, instead of the uh, static routing tables. So let me. So let me go into so an HTC no sandbox. I'm going to create a VPN connection. And I'm going to call it again cloud VPN. It's using the default network, the central region. And this again is the IP address of my VPN gateway here. And then the remote address would be the IP address of my peer gateway on the other side, and that is uh, 104.196.30.176. We're going to use IKv2, and I'll just make my shared secret as HNCNO, and we're going to use a dynamic route, and we're going to use on this side the cloud router, and we're going to create a BGP session. And I'll just call it cloud BGP and the peer ASN, which was 64513 and then 169.254.1.1 for the Google PGP IP address and then for the here okay so now again I'm creating the VPN and again I'm using dynamic BGP instead of using static routes so I'm going to go ahead and save this and create so now I'm going to switch over to the CPB or peer project and create a All right, now we're going to create a VPN connection on the peer side or the CPB 200 side and we're going to uh, configure to use the cloud router for uh, dynamic routes. So create a VPN and we'll call this peer VPN. We have to use the subnetwork, uh, region, US East, and then this is the IP address of the VPN gateway on this side, and then the one on the other side, which is 23.236.53.34, shared secret H Nacino, and we're gonna use dynamic BGP, the peer router that we just created, and we're gonna create this peer BGP session and our peer ASN is 64512 and this is 169.254.1.2 so again the exact opposite of what we had on the other side since we're peering the two together 
and this is 1.1 and now we are ready and we'll go ahead and create so now the VPN is being set up and it's going to go ahead and uh, try to make sure that the uh, connectivity uh, is configured and can communicate with the, P the uh, cloud VPN on the other side so again I'm going to have to give this a second for it to get set up before both sides should turn green And then they'll take a look at the uh, routes that are dynamically created. And notice again, we have kind of the, the mirrors. 104 is this uh, the local address of this gateway, and then 22, 23 on the, is the remote. And on the other side, it's going to be the exact opposite. 23 is the local, and then 104 is the, re is the remote. So our VPN is set up correctly. Now we're going to go and see our on the route on the cloud side. Our cloud BGP router is now give me the green signal and then on the peer side we have the, the go signal here as well so now before I showed you that uh, the routes that were on that were uh, that were put in were put in statically so now what we're gonna do the routes so in the routes we're gonna see the dynamic routes uh, were, were allocated where our destination IP address is this and then on the other side, if we go into the routes and we look for our dynamic routes, notice now we have one, two, three, four, five, and six. But previously I had put in four by typing them in and I kind of purposely left off five and I didn't have six in there as well. But now we've picked up everything from the US East region on the other side. So now if I go back in to on the East region, instance five so here we had a packet loss because again it was coming from rack five and rack five wasn't configured to use the VPN but now you come in here and rack five is allowed to communicate through uh, to an instance on the other side of the gateway and the same thing so this worked before which was instance one in US East on the peer side and again like we did before, it's to continue to work. So really, again, the, the benefits of setting up the uh, dynamic routing with the, with the BGP router is you don't have to manually kind of exchange information and update the routers on both sides uh, when you bring up, in this case, new racks or new subnets on either side of, of uh, the VPN gateway. So it definitely decreases the management and maintenance of the solution. Uh, especially if you're adding, in this case, racks or new subnets to either side of the uh, VPN gateways. Okay, so next thing, now that we've covered the BGP router, is one last networking concept regarding network services. And um, let's do three slides here, and then I'll go into, a, again, a, a, qu a quick demo of how this works. So. Google Cloud Load Balancing is a, again, it's a network service uh, that allows your, your applications to scale uh, not only within the region, but across multiple regions and provide the user with the best experience possible uh, from a latency perspective. So as an example, we have a global IP address, a single global IP address of 120.1.1.1. Uh, .1 .1 .1, and that's basically how a end user 
uh, would access this application. So they would type that in, or it's DNS friendly name, mylamstock.com, and that would, re that would resolve to 120.1.1. The user was coming from California. So in this instance, we have the same application that's deployed in North America and the EU and in Asia. So if a user from California is coming in and hits 120, this single global IP address, uh, they will, we will pick it up in the, into our, our HTTP load balancing proxy. We'll pick it up and realize it's coming from California and route that to the closest instance, in this case, the one located in North America. Also, if we have a user in London, um, again, they're going to hit that same IP address, single global IP address. Uh, we'll pick it up and realize it's coming from London. Going to route that to the to the installation, the deployment that's in the EU. And let's say, as an example, our um, our uh, instance in EMEA, whatever reason, was off went offline, and a user from Singapore enters the same thing. Um, by lampstack.com or 120.1.1.1, uh, our load balancer will take that instance that's in Asia offline and not route there and then know to route it to the next closest installation, which is in EU. So the user in Singapore would, get this, would, would be routed here to the EU instance and get back a response but instead of getting an error if it, was, if it got sent to the, the Asia instance. So. Now let's kind of take a look at that in the uh, console. So this time I have the load balancer all configured in the HNCNO sandbox uh, project. So let me kind of do a quick run through of what's set up. So I've basically created an instance group. And an instance group is really groupings of uh, basically of, of, of instances that are of the same type and typically have, have the same application. So in this case, I have an instance group um, in Central and an instance group in the US East. And within East, there are two instances in East and I have two instances running this application in US Central. So what I want to do is take these four instances and, and load balance it, put it behind a load balancer. And again, given that these are the same application, I want the users who are coming from East get routed to the East um, instances and any users coming from central get routed to the central instances. So let's take a look at the load balancer. So go into networking, load balancing, and I've created this load balancer right here. It's already created. And we'll go into edit mode so you can kind of see the details. So for this load balancer, the backend configuration is these two uh, managed instance groups that I just showed you. So the one in Central, which has, again, two instances in US Central. And we have another managed instance group. Um, we have another, we have another managed instance group right here in US East. Um, yeah, we have one here in, in US East as well. So this one also has two instances. So two in US East, two in US Central. And these are my backend services that are going to be uh, uh, that are going to be sent the requests that are coming to the load balancer. Um, the next thing is kind of the host path. So since these are the exact same um, application, I'm not kind of by the URL. I'm not kind of sending it to, to different versions. So as an example, um, if there was images on the specific backend, I could route that to a specific backend. But in this case, they're both the same app, so they're both going to the same backend instances. Front end configuration, uh, this is HTTP load balancer. We basically asked for a IP address for my load balancer, which is this one right here, 130 to 11, 24, 61. So now, if I go into Compute Engine, and actually let me bring some of these down so I don't get lost. Okay, go in here. So I have this one running in central. So again, I'm going to issue um, issue HTTP requests from these two instances. So I'm going to SSH to this instance in central. 
and I'm going to SSH to this instance in US in US East. All right. So this is the one in US East. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to send traffic to that uh, viewer to that in this case the IP address. So dash C means concurrent connections. I'll say 10. The total number of requests, I'm going to say 1,000. And then I'm going to use the URL, HTTP, and the IP address. So I'm going to send 1,000 requests with concurrency of 10 from an instance here in, in, the, uh, in Central. So sent that off. You can see these fired off really quickly. And let me get this same command. Uh, where is it? It would be oh, so here I was in US Central. And now I'm going to issue command, I'm going to issue traffic. And I'm going to issue a little more traffic from east. So 2000. So we've sent 2,000 from the east, 2,000 requests from the east, and 1,000 requests from the west, I mean from the central. Okay, so now if we go back, so this is east, and we did 2,000. Now if we go back into monitoring, And let me pull out those four instances, two in the east, two in central. So now we're going to go ahead and check out the traffic in, so again, east had 2,000 and central had 1,000. So let's look at central first. So I'm going to go to one of these central instances. And we're going to go down to Nginx requests. And we're going to see a max of about 8.9. Okay, so this is one of the central instances. And then if we go into one of the east instances, And look at its Nginx requests. So we're going to see approximately double that. So 17.8 uh, requests per second. Again, this is east. And if you remember right, east we sent 2,000 requests. And from central we sent 1,000 requests. So you can see that it was load balanced uh, where, the, where the user uh, was located. In this case, the user was located either from east or, cent east or central, and then we routed it to the deployment that was the, the closest to the user, and that served that incoming request and gave a response back. Okay, so I believe that was the end. Um, yep, that was the kind of last thing I was going to cover today. Again, um, as a review, we covered kind of GCP networking, um, what default or legacy networks look like in the single address space, what are subnetworks, what are some of the benefits of subnetworks, um, isolation of networks, isolation of subnets, ability to communicate across subnets. Then we talked about connecting the Google Cloud and using a cloud VPN, um, and then how you can reduce the maintenance um, of, uh, of managing and maintaining the, the routes, the static routes with Cloud VPN on both sides by using a BGP router. And then we went into one of the network services, which is the load balancer service, where we have a global, uh, we provide a global IP address, which gets routed to the closest backend service 
to where the user is located who is initiating those requests. Thank you for your time and uh, see you again on a future video. Thanks.